Hi folks, we are in week two of our song work series. So last time we were working on some folk songs, this time we're working on some jazz tunes, and then next time we'll be doing some classical pieces. So the purpose of this series is to give you a taste of what song work can look like. You know, we focus a lot on exercises, warm-ups, um, but it's really important that we also know what to do with songs. And this is a skill that any singer can develop. Um, you don't, well, I would say most of us rely on voice teachers to help us with song work. Um, and hi, Priyanka, good to have you here. Hello, Em. Um, so hopefully you guys are fans of jazz and we'll learn something today that will help you as you're singing jazz or jazz inspired songs. Um, if you're new here, I'm Camille and um, the tunes that I have are all in the public domain. They are Ain't Misbehavin', on the sunny side of the street, someone to watch over me, and by the light of the silvery moon. And I have sheet music for each of them, so I'll put those links in the, the live chat if you're here. Let's start with Ain't Misbehavin'. And I'll walk you through as well. Thank you so much. Um, let me know if that link works for you. So I'll walk you through, you don't need to read sheet music, thank you, Leandra, um, to be able to use sheet music. And in fact, I actually recommend, even if you don't read sheet music, um, and if you have problems with pitch or intonation, or if you're just not sure if you're singing the correct pitch or not, I think it's so helpful and have found it really, really helpful, even with my very beginning singers, um, to use sheet music. And the reason is, Click that link in, in the live chat and you'll see these little note heads are showing you visually the melody going up and down. And really that's all we care about right now. Of course, there's a lot more information there. There's the rhythm, there's um, you know the chords and stuff, but, uh, but what we're interested in is really just the lyrics and then those note heads going up and down showing us um, yeah, showing us the melody rising and falling. So this is in the key of D. Hopefully, and Leandra, I started teaching, it would have been, hmm, graduated from college 2013, got my teaching credential 2014. So about 10 years now. Um, so we're in the key of D, we might change keys, by the way, but just letting you know, <laughs> this is key of D. No one to talk with. Low voices would be no one to talk with. It is going to get a little bit high. So I'm going to say, let's move this maybe to the key of B flat. No one to talk with all by myself. Hopefully that's an easier fit for most voices. So even though the sheet music is in the key of D, I'm gonna be transposing this to the key of B flat to make it more singable for folks. And we're going to walk through this, you know, a couple phrases at a time. And you'll see here on the top, medium, slow, swing. That's really important for us to understand right off the bat when we're learning anything jazzy. There's a ton of jazz tunes in which the eighth notes are what we call swung. Um, Carrie, is alto a low voice or a high voice? An alto or contralto is the lowest of the kind of traditionally female voice types. So from high to low, soprano, mezzo-soprano, and then alto. Um, contralto, that, that's just the term for a solo singer. Alto, you know, I would call myself an alto. I wouldn't get fancy and say I'm going to contralto, but but you'll see both. Um, and then after that, so we have soprano, mezzo, soprano, alto, and then we have tenor, baritone, and bass. And there are some other distinctions in there, but those are kind of the main six big solo voice types. Um, what is my favorite voice? My favorite song to sing? That's a wonderful question. Um, certainly don't have one favorite. Oh boy, I was really enjoying singing. Um, na, 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 na. Make you feel my love. 
<laughs> I could not think of the title. <laughs> um, I think it's a Bob Dylan original, but a lot of people know the Adele version. Okay, so let's jump into this. We're talking about um, eighth notes being swung. I, I know I said you don't need to read sheet music, but it's good to know a lot of music that we read, we're counting basically to four. We're going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four to keep us in time. Eighth notes, um, they are smaller than those one, two, three, four quarter note beats. And we would count those as one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Swung eighth notes, which happens when we have a song that we're you know, snapping our fingers too, like, so no one to walk with, but I'm happy on the shelf. We wouldn't count one and two and three and four and, we actually count one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. And hi, Wayne. So that's what we mean by swung eighth notes. And this is medium slow swing. So uh, really what a swung eighth note is, the first eighth note in every little grouping of two is longer. So instead of it being equal, one and two and three and four and, we have one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. So that's what we have going on here. So if you read any sheet music at all and you're like, this doesn't sound like I thought it would, that's why. Um, it's just a lot easier to notate saying swing and then writing regular eighth notes. Um, what's a good and easy vocal warm up for beginners? Anything that is semi closed. Um, and I actually, I'm usually looking for a straw, and today I actually have one in this cup of water. And um, this is probably the best, easiest vocal exercise for beginners too advanced. Um, take a straw, submerge it in water, and you sing through the straw. And the reason we use water, it, it provides a little bit more resistance, um, but it also tells you if you're doing it correctly because what you're looking for are bubbles and sound at the same time. So hopefully you can hear some sound happening and you see those bubbles. Um, and then once you've got that, you can take the straw out of the water. You don't need to keep using water, but a lot of people like it. And um, the exercise would be singing on any pattern you like or sliding up and down. Sliding up and down in pitch. Um, so that's a nice easy one because you don't need a piano or anything really to sing along with. You're just kind of feeling out your voice, what's comfortable, trying to go as low as you can comfortably, as high as you can comfortably. And the reason that's helpful, singing through the straw, is it's, I don't wanna say you can't hurt yourself, maybe you could, but it's almost impossible to hurt yourself singing on something so gentle and semi-closed like that. Um, it helps balance the air pressure, so you have this pressure underneath your vocal folds coming up, and what the straw does and other exercises like it is it sends some of that air back to your vocal folds. So you've got air pressure from above now as well as just from beneath the vocal folds. So that balance of air pressure helps make things a lot, a lot easier for your vocal folds. Um, so less, yeah, less pressure, less effort. That's always a good thing and very, very good for a warm up. Um, and Sheila's asking, is it okay to use a something plastic in place of a singing straw. So you mean just a regular straw? Absolutely, you do not need a fancy straw. This is just a drinking straw. I got, you know, a bagel at a place earlier with my daughter and my husband. And um, yeah, it, this is just the <laughs> cup of water that I got from the from the bagel shop. And, and it's just a regular straw, um, if that was the question. I know there are some fancy ones that are stainless steel and, you know, but you certainly don't need that to start out. Okay, before we get too off track, I wanna teach you Ain't Misbehavin and, and go over any jazz specific things that you might encounter in song work. So again, we're singing this in the key of B flat. I'm gonna sing maybe the first two kind of sentences or phrases. So I'll sing it first, you sing it back to me. We have no one to talk with all by myself. Listen again or sing with me this time. I'll count us off. I'll go um, 
for now, I'm just going to say, and a sing. <laughs> I'll count you off better later on. But just for the sake of time, I'll say, and a sing. No one to talk with all by myself. Try it one more time. And a sing. No one to talk with all by myself. Okay, next line. No one to walk with. No one to walk with. So all of those are very, very similar. You'll see that pattern. You have the three eighth notes, no one, two, all by my, no one, two. And then you have a, a held note or a repeated note. Okay, so try those three phrases all one after the other. No one to talk with, all by myself, no one to walk with. And then we'll get the last part of this phrase. And sing, no one to talk with. All by myself, no one to walk with. Okay? Kind of feels natural. You're just like stair stuffing up. Next line, but I'm happy on the shelf. But I'm happy on the shelf. I mentioned last week that these little chromatic walk downs would be something we encounter in jazz, and here it is. <laughs> um, so you'll see that little what's called a natural sign on the word the, I'm happy on the. So that tells you that pitch is actually not found in the key. And so it, it gives us kind of a, a cool feeling. So putting it all together, making sure we're still in the key of B flat. No one to talk with all by myself. No one to walk with, but I'm happy on the shelf. Okay, give that a try. I know that last line might be a little bit, a little bit fuzzy, but do your best. Again, I'm gonna say, and sing, no one to. And sing, no one to talk with, all by myself. No one to walk with, but I'm happy on the shelf. Cool. Finishing out this phrase, ain't misbehaving, I'm saving my love. You've already sung those exact pitches. It's just different words now. So if you, um, the way the music is laid out on this sheet music is really, really helpful because it shows you that clearly. No one to talk with all by myself. Same exact notes. If you look down the line, ain't misbehaving, I'm saving my love. And this is another reason that I highly recommend using sheet music when you learn a song because you see patterns like this and it makes learning the song a lot easier. It just clicks in your brain um, better. Anytime that you can use more than one of your senses, uh, more than one tool to learn, the better and, and the quicker we learn. Usually when we're learning a song, all we have is our ears. Sometimes we'll be looking at the lyrics. Maybe you learn songs along with a lyric video. Um, but a lot of times people are just kind of casually listening and, and then eventually picking up the lyrics. So sheet music gives us so much more information. We have, you know, the lyrics there and the melody in visual form. Okay, finishing out this phrase. Ain't misbehaving, I'm saving my love for you. So finishing it out, we just land on that note. And um, the next chunk, the next two systems, I believe the melody is going to be exactly the same, except for one note, it looks like. <laughs> so that's good news. We've got another pattern we've recognized. Um, and I think for this song and for the sake of time, I'm going to stop right there. So this is, we have the A section, see that big A in a box, and then B, and then C. I think we're just gonna focus on the A section and then we'll go to a different song to switch it up. Okay, so this next bit, I know for certain the one I love, I'm through with flirting, it's just you I'm thinking of, in this behaving. I'm saving my love for you. So the only difference there is my love for you versus this time my love for you. And 
that feels unnatural for me to sing because the versions I've listened to of this song, they go, my love for, I think you, I think they take it up instead of you. Um, so anyways, it feels weird to land on that low note, but that's what the sheet music says to do. So, so the first thing for our song work, you know, right now we're just kind of learning, familiarizing ourselves with the melody. But the next step is going to be analyzing this and picking apart what's difficult about this. Um, what's difficult, you know, for me personally, for people in general <laughs> singing songs like this, and how can we make it easier? What can we work on to, um, yeah, to make it easier and sound better? And I see an, a question about belting and while that's not the focus of our lesson today, we do have other lessons on belting, um, essentially to give you kind of a quick like to-do list, because that's not something that you could really cover in, in a day anyways, um, is first having kind of a solid foundation with your chest voice and your head voice and really developing what we call mix or middle voice. That is key because belting, when we think of belting, it's high, loud, powerful, um, and it's typically higher than your chest or speaking voice naturally goes to. And that's why it can be a little bit, mm, it can be dangerous <laughs> um, because what people do, um, what, you know, a beginning singer might do is just shout and push to get their speaking voice up higher, even though it can't. And that's just not sustainable. You can't do it for that long. So that's why we really need to first work on getting our um, chest voice, head voice, and then developing mix so that we can sing higher what, what mix allows us to do is to sing beyond that natural break of the speaking voice, um, but still with some intensity, not, not totally letting go of some of your chest voice or speaking voice function. So that is where you've got to start. And we have a ton as well on mix, mix exercises for beginners. So that's really where I would start um, is kind of going through that checklist with yourself. Do I have a good handle on my chest voice, my head voice, mix development? And then belting is a matter of within that mix zone, you know, when you're singing like for a higher voice, you know, when you're singing in this A, B flat, B, C, that range or even higher, um, that you are employing a few different methods to boost the intensity of the sound without just squeezing or pushing um, or trying to make it louder. Um, because again, we don't want to be shouting. Shouting is something that we can't do for long periods of time. And, um, ooh, Sheila has a good question. Do you use vocal fry in jazz? Sheila, I don't have a good answer for that. I don't know what a, like, you know, legit jazz historian would say, off the top of my head, it's not something that we hear very often in jazz. I think of a little bit more kind of clean tone. Would it be inappropriate to use? I don't think so. I think you could make it work, but it might sound... It, vocal fry is definitely more a contemporary thing, you know, pop and R&B and, you know, other modern styles. So might sound a little, the word might be anachronistic. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm using that correctly, um, but like out of its proper time, you know? So, but is that wrong? I, you know, that's that's kind of up to you. And, and if you were singing for like a, you know, true jazz purist, maybe maybe they wouldn't like that. Um, yeah, so I would say probably in, in, in general, like I'm, I'm thinking of who are the jazz greats and did, did I hear them using a lot of vocal fry, you know, did Ella Fitzgerald and Nat King Cole and Frank Sinatra, I can't think of them using a ton of vocal fry. And if you don't know what that is, it's creeping into my speaking voice quite a lot, especially at the ends of sentences and, um, vocal fry is that 
that creaky sound. And it's totally appropriate in a lot of contemporary styles like pop. But um, yeah, I'll have to keep my ear out for that. <laughs> um, so let's put this together now. We're kind of practicing, uh, you know, reading sheet music, and then we'll We'll also use this as an opportunity for you to think what is challenging, what is, um, you know, what's not sounding great, what would you want to work on if you were working on this song in a voice lesson? What's the spot? And that's usually what I would do with a student too is, okay, I might have noticed some things, but I want to hear from you first. How did that feel? And what are the spots that concern you? And so, I'm gonna ask you, what are the spots that concern you as we sing this through? So, again, starting at the top, we're doing these first four complete lines or systems. I'm gonna give you a one, a two, a one, two, three, four, go. Okay, that, that'll be our count off this time. No one to talk with. That's how we're starting. A one, a two, a one, two, three, Four, go. No one to talk with all by myself. No one to walk with, but I'm happy on the shelf. Ain't misbehaving. I'm saving my love for you. Next line. I know for certain the one I love. I'm through with flirting. It's just you I'm thinking of. Ain't misbehaving. I'm saving my love for you. The next bit goes on like Jack Horner in the corner. If you want to know what that next part sounds like. Uh, don't go nowhere, what do I care? Your kisses are worth waiting for, believe me. And then blessedly, the uh, C section or the third bit of this is almost a repeat of the A section. So you basically learned the song. <laughs> You've you're learned, you know, three quarters of the song at this point. So for you, what were the tricky spots? Um, I'll give you a minute to think, maybe sing in your head, and I'll also think through what were the tricky spots for me, or what do I think the tricky spots would be for most people. So as I'm looking at the sheet music and thinking, I think one spot that might have been unexpected for some folks would be holding out the word you so long because we kind of have a lot of short notes ain't misbehaving i'm saving my love for you it's kind of a long time so if you were unprepared for that if you were like oh i didn't know that note was going to be so long um you might have felt a little bit pressed for breath maybe you felt like you were running out of air so that's one potential spot Um, another potential spot of trickiness would be the fourth line, or the, sorry, the fourth bar. The, no, no one to walk with, but I'm happy on the shelf. I'm happy on the shelf. So that's the rhythm as written, but I've just never heard anyone sing it that way. So that little walk down on the shelf, on the shelf. For some singers, uh, for a lot of singers, that would take some extra practice. Um, so in the key of B flat, those pitches walking down are D, D flat, and then C. And if you see it on a keyboard, you'll see that those three pitches could not be any closer together. <laughs> it's a white key, the black key right next to it, and then another white key right next to that. Um, so that's what we'd call a chromatic walk down or an instance of chromaticism. Um, and again, that 
kind of weird note, so to speak. It, it doesn't belong in the key, but it fits really well um, within the song. And you'll find that quite a lot in jazz. So that's another spot. Let me know if you're here live. Was there anything? Okay, so Sheila had something save in my love for you the second time around um, landing on the D, if we were in the key of D. Yeah. Um, so when we have, I'm saving my love for you. Yeah. So especially, this is a great example. I don't know if this is what you're encountering, Sheila, but it's a great example of a register shift happening and maybe you're not prepared for it. So you can hear, at least the way that I'm singing it right now, kind of very casually, I'm saving my love, my love. I'm singing, you know, kind of lighter for you. That transition from for with more of a kind of head voicey mixy sound and then back into chest voice for the word you. Transitions like that, again, I'll sing them back to back. For you, for you. That can feel a little bit clunky if you're not sure what's going to happen vocally. For you, you know, if you aren't sure if you're going to approach that D, looking at the sheet music, approach the, the word you in kind of more chest speaking voice or if it's going to still be a little bit more mixy. Um, so that's something that I could, I could definitely see myself also having to make a decision on. Um, and it's not so much of an issue on the first time around. I ain't misbehaving. I'm saving my love for you because for and you, I'm keeping, you know, both in that head voice mixy sound. Um, so, yeah, does that make sense? Anytime you have a register shift happening, especially quickly, that that is a potential tricky spot. Um, so for some people, maybe the first line, the aim is behaving, if you're kind of chest voice and then a mix, <laughs> you know, that could be a, a potential tricky spot too. Hopefully not, but but every now and then you you run into like a, a bit of clunkiness. And really the fix there is just making a decision of what kind of register or mode feels and sounds the best for this specific lyric or this specific phrase. And then if I'm having a hard time accessing it just by choosing to, um, then do I need to modify the vowel or the consonant to help me in some way. So right there, and I say, I see um, Usman has a question and I'll get to that shortly. Um, so Sheila, if that was the case for you, I'm saving my love for you, for, for you, for you. I don't know that there's much that we can do to alter that lyric to make it easier. I think it's just uh, going back and forth and, and getting comfortable with that register shift. Um, and maybe even doing the opposite. You for, you for. That feels a little bit easier, a little bit more natural. And then go back the other way. So you for, for you, for you. And, and then just committing that, okay, that, that you is going to be a nice, strong, solid chest voice. Um, Sometimes though, hopefully we, we encounter another example, sometimes you will get a section where you can change the vowel or the consonant in some way to make that reg register shift more natural. Um, Usman was saying, the question, I have no idea about singing, just came across this channel. What can I do? I tried a bit of the exercise, like a na-na one. Is it the na 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 something like that? Or is it a more like a na 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 or a na 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 na? I'm not sure what exercise it is. Um, yeah, if you if you can be more specific about what exercise it is and how I can help you with that, I would love to. Um, so I do want to jump into a different song. Yes, the second one, the 
like a na 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 or a, or a nay exercise, something like that. So what what's the question there? Because you're saying it's only six out of a hundred on app. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what what uh, what you mean by that. Um, so I want to jump into another song example. We have basically the only kind of jazz specific things we addressed here were um, swung eighth notes. And nothing else was really jazz specific. Um, the, the one note I would give though, um, if you're working on this song, is to keep something like this pretty conversational. And when you have sustains, to not default to, to vibrato every time. So that's one thing that I got in trouble with my first jazz teacher in college. I got in trouble for using vibrato on every sustain. So what I mean is it's the difference between no one to talk with, letting vibrato ring all by myself, vibrato, no one to walk with, but I'm happy on the shelf, vibrato. <laughs> Basically, because I was a musical theater kid, I was used to vibrato on every single sustain or every held note. And um, while vibrato is used in jazz, it's thought of more as an effect, not a constant. So you use it intentionally, depending on the style or the singer, sometimes sparingly. So, and you can just compare which version sounds more jazzy to you if you're singing. No one to talk with all by myself versus no one to talk with all by myself. So almost no vibrato there. You can use it. No one to talk with all by myself little bit of fluttery vibrato at the end, but this could be a challenge for you if you come from a musical theater or more classical background, really any background where vibrato is encouraged all the time. Um, this can feel weird. And uh, so this is a good challenge for you. If you like this song, then I would encourage you to minimize maybe Think about restraining that vibrato just as an exercise and then add it back in, but you're choosing to, you know, you're, you're making the choice to sprinkle a little bit of vibrato. So that could look like, you know, no vibrato, no one to walk, no one to talk with all by myself, no one to walk with, but I'm happy on the shelf. Hey, misbehaving, I'm saving my love for you. And you'll notice it'll it'll like jump out at you where vibrato is needed. So especially on that long held note, you it feels so flat and boring to not do anything with it. So that that note is begging for a little bit of vibrato at the end or somewhere. Um, but that can be a nice nice exercise to get yourself a little bit more into jazz mode and. Um, intentionally use vibrato as an effect, but but not all the time. Usman is saying I'm becoming a doctor in fourth year of med study. Congrats. Fourth year um, hopefully is a lot more fun than first and second year at least. <laughs> Third and fourth year, hopefully you're, you know, doing more in the hospital and uh, that's usually more fun than all the studying of first and second year. But I want to learn singing now, a very bad monotonous voice. I just want to ask how I should spend my time if I want to pick it up as a hobby or ah, or if it's a lot of time investment and not worthy if I don't plan on pursuing a career. Um, okay, totally worth your time. Um, I would say I, I think it's a very, very doable for someone to take up singing as a hobby and not have it be this like hours a day investment. I really do. I think that, um, you know, you can learn little bit by little bit. And for you, especially because a lot of your time is, you know, studying and, you know, 
kind of thinking more scientifically, I think this would be a really fun, creative outlet for you. Um, so I would recommend, I think for kind of to get off on a good foot, I would recommend um, figuring out what your range is. Um, I have some, I definitely have videos on the channel on figuring out your vocal range and, and a blog post as well. Uh, so figuring out what's your comfortable range and then making sure that the warm ups you look for or the lessons um, or the songs that you choose to sing, making sure that those fit reasonably well within that comfortable range. So someone asked about alto before, you know, if you, like I would identify my voice as an alto voice, and that's because my comfortable, best usable range aligns with the alto range. And so if you go to either, you know, a video here on the channel, if you just type in vocal range on the channel or, you know, vocal range, 30 day singer blog and, and see, I, I can try to track that down for you as well. Um, it'll walk you through kind of using a chromatic tuner to sing your lowest note and your highest note and finding your comfy range. Uh, that way it's just good to know. And then, like I said, once you compare that to some of the other vocal ranges, you'll, you'll see, oh, okay, I'm, you know, kind of a baritone or I'm more of a tenor, whatever it is. Then, uh, then you have some guidance. Okay, great. Cool. So baritone. So then when you're looking for warmups, making sure that the warmups you choose, the exercises, or um, even the teacher, um, especially for a super beginner, it's helpful to have a teacher at times who's demonstrating in a voice similar to yours. Um, you don't need that all the time, but if you have, if you really struggle matching pitch, that's usually a good idea. Um, so that's why, you know, we go back and forth, myself and Abram, the other 30-day singer teacher, because for lower voices who have a hard time matching my pitch, even though I play on the piano for two octaves, um, you know, some some folks need to hear it in a human voice. So uh, anyways, you're looking for teachers, warm-ups, exercises that, that suit that range, and then songs that are an easy fit for those voices. Um, I just recently compiled a big old list of songs for each voice type and um, and have also covered that on the channel too. If you look up easy songs for baritones, 30 day singer, um, you'll at least have, have a handful to start with and look for other famous singers who are baritones. Let me find, um, I wrote a blog on this. So I'm gonna find that for you because it does have some singer suggestions for you to listen to. For a beginner, it's, um, it can be very disheartening to always sing along and try, uh, try songs by people who, whose voice type is really different from yours because you think, oh my goodness, there's something wrong with me. I can't sing as high as them or as low as them. So hopefully you can follow that link that I just put in the chat. And this is an article on low voice type, space, baritone, and tenor range. And within there, I have uh, those ranges listed and then a list of famous baritones, George Ezra, Matt Berninger from The National, Beck, James Blake, Michael Buble, Johnny Cash, the list goes on, and um, and those those can be also good guideposts for you. And you know, looking up songs by those singers, see if it's an easy fit for you. That's where I would start um, is making sure that you're you're starting off in a somewhat comfy range. And um, oh, Sheila's asking how to use the Ninja Voice Tuner to get the mic working. So typically, if you We'll use the chromatic tuner at times um, within lessons. So if you go to tuner.ninja, you have to give it permission. Um, so if it didn't ask you for permission to use your mic, like for me, when I press start, 
then a little window comes up saying tuner.ninja wants to use your microphone and then I can either press allow or block. So that's how it works for me. Um, it, it might be a like restart your device situation. I don't know, but that's, that's what I would try at first is, you know, clicking start. If it doesn't ask for permission to use your mic, then perhaps restarting, you know, the browser at least, and then maybe restarting the device, but it's just a website. It could be that the, there's something funky going on with the website too. I don't know. Um, okay. Jumping into another tune. Let's do on the sunny side of the street. So here is a link. And you can see 1930. I'm going to skip forward to the chorus. And again, I'm going to be picky and change the key to one that's going to work for more people. <laughs> I'm changing to the key of A. Grab your coat and get your hat. Leave the worry on the doorstep. So again, it's written in the key of C, but we're going to sing it in the key of A. And we don't care about what the actual pitches are because we're just using this to see the melody going up and down. What I want to talk about here straight away is, you know, we've we've got this like swing, swung eighth notes thing. A really important additional component in jazz, in other styles too, but like really in jazz, is what we call back phrasing. So there's a way that a song is written. Okay, I just sang it for you, but I'll sing it again. Grab your coat and get your hat. Leave your worry on the doorstep. Hopefully, it sounds a little bit boring to you because it's written very plainly and you'll never hear a singer sing it like I just did. <laughs> you'll hear, grab your coat, and get your hat, leave your worry on the doorstep. So I'm changing the timing, I'm changing the rhythm. Um, and it's, of course it makes it more interesting, but, um, but it's also hopefully helping the listener understand the story a little bit better. Um, so back phrasing, you can be behind the beat, meaning a little bit late. You can be ahead of the beat, meaning a little bit early. And, um, you know, you don't just go entirely rogue. You, what you'll hear a lot of times, like I, I use Fly Me to the Moon as a great example of this. If you take a look at the sheet music and then you listen to Frank Sinatra or whoever singing it, you're going to notice they'll slow down at times, they'll speed up at times, but they'll eventually make their way back to being in time. Um, if they didn't, then things would get really messy and what you sing wouldn't match well with the chords. So, but hopefully that makes sense. Essentially, you're, you're just taking some liberty with the timing. Um, you can also take some liberties with the pitches, but especially as we're just learning a song, I think taking liberty with the timing is the best place to start. It feels the most doable. So we have some more chromaticism, which is fun. Uh, we've got, so you can hear I'm playing in two octaves. So for the low voices, For high voices, you're singing with me. Grab your coat and get your hat. Leave your worries. But low voices, we have you down here. And we have this instance of chromaticism on leave your worries. As written, it's E, E flat, D, C. But in our new key, C sharp, C, B, A. <laughs> um, Usman is asking big questions. I, 
definitely can't answer that question for you. Um, this is a, uh, that's a big life decision. The first thing that comes to my mind is med school debt and, and the reality of that. Um, being in fourth year, you're so close to the finish line. Um, so the things, you know, I'm, I'm a voice teacher. I'm not, I'm not a, a life coach or a career coach. <laughs> um, but having, you know, loved ones in the medical field, those are the things that would be on my mind are debt. And, um, and then, you know, what possibilities exist post schooling, um, you know, cause there are many different paths, you know, that people with people in the medical field end up taking, you know, not everybody stays as a hospitalist or, you know, general practitioner, depending on where you are, you know, there can be a lot of, a lot of different moves to make. Um, so that's, that's all I, I'll say, but I feel for you. I do. Um, but I would definitely be leaning on your support system, family and friends who know you well and, um, and can help you help, help advise, um, for big decisions like that. So my friends, um, Mm. And someone is saying practically everybody loves making music, far fewer of them make a living at it. And that is extremely true. Yeah, that's, that's realistic. Um, and so I think practical matters are always a, a part of this discussion as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to make a living doing music full time. I read an article the other day on, um, what is her name? It's the singer, Lauren Allred. I was going to say Lauren Daigle. That's another singer, Lauren Allred, um, who was the voice of Jenny Lind in The Greatest Showman. She did that song, Never Enough, the Never Enough, you know, super big, amazing song, incredible singer. And even she, you would think like, oh my goodness, she's famous. She, um, you know, had this really, really popular song. She's been on all the, like, America's Got Talent and Britain's Got Talent and um, has had record deals and, uh, you know, songs in movies and all of that. And still, you know, she's self-funding an album and she is doing corporate singing gigs in order to do that. She said that's, you know, she's not making enough singing what she wants to sing. She's, she's doing these, these corporate gigs where like entertainers are, are brought in for corporate events, you know, companies have something going on a conference or whatever. And then, um, and they want entertainment. So I just thought that was super interesting that even people who look like they're at like the highest level, you know, it would be a dream to have a voice like that or a song in a movie or, you know, whatever your dream is. Um, and, and still that person is kind of hustling and, and having these like side gigs to fund what they actually want to do within music, which is, you know, working on their album. So yeah, it's, it's important, I think, to have the realism of that, um, and to talk with people in the field. So whatever you're considering, you know, to, talk with people who do that thing, whatever it is, and, and ask them for a realistic take on the path they took and, you know, what are the norms? Okay. So this song, <laughs> back to the song on the sunny side of the street, which we've transposed to a, we have this little instance of chromaticism again, the leave no worry. So that would be something to work on. The other thing to work on that we already mentioned is this, this concept of back phrasing or, um, you know, altering the timing. And I would encourage you to listen to other jazz songs compared to the sheet music or even just comparing one version to another and just notice the liberties that these singers take. Give yourself a little bit of permission to take liberties too. Um, 
let's think through what else might be tricky in a song like this. I'll sing a little bit more of it for you. I know we don't have a ton of time to learn, learn it. Grab your coat and get your hat. Leave your worry on the doorstep. Just direct your feet to the sunny side of the street. Um, so that little bit of chromaticism. Feet to, feet to the sunny. That would be something to work on. Sunny side of the street. Can't you hear the pitter pat? That big jump. Pitter pat. That's a jump. Uh, that's a jump of a sixth. So it's it's a big jump. That's something that I would work on. Making sure not only that I've got that pitch, you know, solidly, but uh, also that I um, that I feel grounded for that high note, whatever it is that I I know, yeah, how to approach it. Now that happy tune is your step, life can be so sweet on the sunny side of the street. I used to walk in the shade. And then that's that's how the song keeps on going. Let me rack my brain really quick. And Sheila's given some advice as well. Aw. Yeah, you know, we're talking about having a hobby that that does take, I think, some work to enjoy. Because um, it's not that fun to do something that you're not that good at, right? So I understand the question. Um, yeah, I guess, Sheila, the thing that comes to my mind is, you know, feeling like you waited too long. But what if you waited even longer? And then you'd be like, oh, man, I wish I started when I was 30 or 50 or whatever the age is, you know. So I think I think it's a good good motivation and good reminder for us to if if there's something that we do enjoy that we want to do that we make the time for it now because, you know, that old phrase if if you're not doing something because of the time it's going to take the time will pass anyways. And so you could either let five or 10 years go by not doing that thing, or, you know, imagine how much further along you'll be in five years or 10 years. Um, so, but it, it is, like I said, it's when you have a hobby in the beginning, it's just, it's new and interesting. And that's motivating because you're learning all the time. But then you sometimes get sort of stuck at a level and you want to get to the next level you want to be good enough at it to enjoy to feel like you've got some you know control over the thing whatever it is whether it's singing or playing piano so um yeah our physical skills as well so any i know we're almost out of time here i haven't devoted too much attention to this song here just for the sake of time. Grab your coat and get your hat. Leave your worry on the doorstep. So that might be another little register shift situation. Leave your worry on the doorstep. So the kind of natural natural transition point for me is the word doorstep kind of landing back into a solid chest voice situation but i could imagine for other voices maybe the transition happens sooner on leave your worry on the or on the doorstep so um kind of a nitty-gritty note but a practical note when you have a transition to make between registers, you know, it feels, it feels like a, a switch or a, or a flip. Look for the beginning of a word with a consonant and look for a somewhat larger leap. So it would be tricky, trickier to make that transition door 
Leave the worry on. Like on the word on, that's tricky because it doesn't start with a consonant. Leave the worry on the, it feels kind of forced. Leave the worry on the doorstep. Doorstep feels easy because you're starting with a consonant. Um, it's relatively low in the range. But does that make sense, especially for Sheila, because I know you you brought this up um, in the last tune. That's just something that I can't remember if I learned it from a teacher or if I figured it out myself. <laughs> but when registered transitions need to take place, look for pitches that aren't right next to each other. It's hard to make make a shift when you're singing, let's say, a D one way, and then you want to sing an E a, a different way. It's much easier to sing, you know, say a D one way and then an A another way because there's a big jump. Um, so look for that, uh, an interval, you know, somewhat larger, and then look for consonants because those give you a clear, like, reset. Whereas words that start with vowels, not as clear of a reset and they can kind of just flow or they, they do flow from the word that preceded it. Worry on versus worry on the door, if that makes sense. Um, Mary, I wish that I could help you. We're two minutes from the end of our time together, but living on a prayer, Bon Jovi, um, I would, thinking through that song, So that feels very much like a great use of a, a nice kind of like what might be called screlting, <laughs> scream belting, but it's really like you're in mix. Oh, you know, you're, you're not full on shouting, certainly not screaming. Um, but, but you, you really are in kind of a lighter mix that then you put some edge on. So that would be my very, very quick advice for Living on a Prayer by Bon Jovi would be, if you haven't already, really start working on your head voice and beefing up your, um, what might be felt as like a head dominant mix. So it's not, Ooh, you know, it's, it's not a hooty head voice. It's, Oh, it's, it's got a little bit of edge to it, a little bit of, you know, brightness, cattiness. Um, so, so working on your head voice, but then using some exercises that are bratty, catty, wide vowel. So think things like the na, na, nas, nay, nay, nays. Um, so sounds like that, that get you into that witchy, <laughs> witchy vibe up there. I hope that makes sense. Um, thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Mary. I hope that, um, you know, we can do more on this topic that the, the tricky thing with these song work videos is for the 30 day channel, we, we want to stick to, um, public domain songs. And so, uh, so those are copyright free and typically they are, um, older songs as well. Um, so for these more modern, like pop and rock tunes, they, uh, they don't make their way onto the channel quite as often, um, because, you know, YouTube will say, Hey, that song doesn't belong to you and, and can take the video down. Um, so that's why just FYI. Um, but thank you for being here next week. We're shifting modes, going to do some, oh, actually next week I think is Abram and then maybe the week following. I'll have to look at the schedule. But the next time we are together, whenever that is, um, we'll be working on some classical tunes and specifically doing this song work. So I know we're going to encounter issues there because um, <laughs> classical music is is doesn't come naturally, I think, for, for a lot of folks, especially if you haven't been trained in that style. So breathing, phrasing, vowel shaping, um, all of that will happen. <laughs> um, Elise Rambo, Rambo, thank you.
All right. I will see you next time. Oh, and by the way, the other tunes that we didn't have time for, Someone to Watch Over Me, and then By the Light of the Silvery Moon. If you want, um, we, we spent a lot of time on Someone to Watch Over Me in a different live lesson, and that one was How to Sing Like Ella Fitzgerald. So if you're like, oh, I was really hoping to do the that song, Someone to Watch Over Me, then type in Ella Fitzgerald, Camille, 30 Day Singer, something like that. Um, into YouTube and uh, or specifically on the channel that'll get you your best result and uh, and you can walk through that song with me and that'll be more jazz style and song work as well so if you want go for that <laughs> bye